Oh, well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Business Spotlight Series. My name is Mark McNulty, and I'm president of Action Coach Bluegrass in Southern Indiana. Today, I have Dr. Alice, CEO and founder of Surgical Serenity Solutions, as my guest. Now, today, we're going to be talking about her business, her journey to business ownership, and the different types of challenges and best practices, and share a little peek into what it's really like to build and operate a business, especially a really special business like this one. If this is your first time on our channel, be sure to like and subscribe so you get notifications each time we get a podcast up. So Dr. Alice, welcome and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Mark. It's such a pleasure to be here and I appreciate your helping me to let people know about my business. Yeah, so go ahead and tell us a little bit about your business and what you do and how you got started in this. Okay, my business, let me just start with what we are. We provide preloaded headphones, preloaded with therapeutic music. I am a clinical musicologist, and we provide these headphones for patients who are going into surgery and have a lot of anxiety, probably have pain, and many, many studies, like hundreds of studies around the world, have shown that when patients are listening to music through headphones during a procedure, especially a certain type of music that has a slow, steady pulse and is purely instrumental that they experience less anxiety and less pain perception. And what that translates into is less medication. One of the medications they give for anxiety is Valium and Xanax. Those are called benzodiazepines and they have a great addictive potential I mean, it doesn't happen every single time, obviously, but the potential for addiction is definitely there with benzodiazepines as well as with opioids, which they give for pain. So if we can reduce the amount of benzos and opioids by using slow, steady, soothing music coming directly into the brain through these headphones and blocking out conversations in the OR, that's going to be a huge win-win for everybody. That's awesome. So what got you into that? Well, in 1990, let's go back to 1990, I got my PhD in musicology from U of L. And soon after that, I was invited to become the first coordinator of music and medicine at the U of L School of Medicine. Wow. They had gotten a large grant for holistic, complementary, and alternative medicine. And they brought in a man named Dr. Joel Elkies, who started the music and arts program there, arts and medicine. And I was chosen to be the first coordinator of music and medicine. They had art expressive therapy. They had photography. They had dance. They had all kinds of arts that were known to have healing powers and then brought in individuals to do specific research studies on their specialty, in my case, music and medicine. So originally I was looking at the power of music with Alzheimer's patients, as well as the phenomenon of chanting as a way of calming the mind and body. And in the course of doing those two studies, I came across a lot of information about the power of music in surgery, but nobody was talking about that. Nobody was writing about it that I knew anyway, not in Louisville or Kentucky or even the Midwest. And so one of my friends heard me mention that. I started doing a lot of speaking in the area. And she said, Alice, one thing you talk about that I don't think people are aware of at all is the power of music with surgery. And she said, I think you ought to go deep with that. So I started doing a lot more research into that and asking people that I knew, family members and friends to start with, if they would be willing to listen to some music through headphones during their surgery and explain the benefits and talk to a lot of surgeons and anesthesiologists. And they were all like, sure, that's fine. As a matter of fact, I had surgery myself during that period. I had back surgery. And my doctor let me bring in a Walkman, which in the early 90s, that's what we had, cassette tape and Walkman. And he literally taped that Walkman to the operating table. And then there was a cord to my headphones. 
So about the same time, I joined my first business organization, which was actually the National Speakers Association. And we had monthly meetings and brought in experts about how to get your speaking career off. Mm -hmm. I was also doing my research and CDs were coming along. And I actually went over and talked to a woman who was about to be head of surgery at the new Jewish East Hospital. And I said, how about having a music and surgery department and creating seven or eight CDs that you could then sell around the world? You know, you could license this music and sell it around the world. And unfortunately, she just was not into it at all. (laughs) So never heard back from her. But in the meantime, I kept getting family, friends, friends of friends, neighbors, anybody that I knew. I mean, people have surgery all day, every day around the world. And so I was getting more and more people to try using music and I would help them create their own playlist with the music that they particularly like and responded to, as long as it had the slow, steady tempo and was purely instrumental. So the big turning point was in 2005. My organization, National Speakers Organization, announced a conference they were going to have in Cancun. And I thought, I got to go to that one. (laughs) And it was called Cancun University, and you could have a major and a minor. So my major was product innovation, and my minor was internet marketing. And the first day of the class, it was taught by an inventor who had like 30 patents. He said, try to think of an idea that would solve a universal problem, but in a very simple way. And he said, for example, think of the guy that invented the cardboard collar for hot coffee. He said, that guy is a multimillionaire on a beach somewhere by now. And it was a simple idea, but it solved a problem. The woman had just sued McDonald's for getting burned in the drive through And he said, now go back to your room tonight and think really hard about something along your lines of work that you could create that would help a big problem. Almost immediately, I had this idea, what about headphones that would be waiting for the patient when they got to the hospital would already have the ideal soothing, slow, serene music. And, oh, I was so excited. I mean, I was, because I knew that was a good idea. So the next day when I got to the class, he said, okay, now you've got to search the internet to see if anybody's already done that. And if they haven't, then you apply for a provisional patent immediately. So anyway, that's what I did. I did get the patent in 2008. Congratulations. That's hard to do. First, I had a patent attorney in Arizona where this inventor lived that was our professor. And he totally failed three times. So I talked to a man in SCORE here. SCORE was very helpful in the early days. Service Corps of Retired Executives for anybody that doesn't know. And there was a patent attorney in SCORE in Louisville. And he was great. And he said, Alice, I won't say the name of the attorney I used, I guess. But he said, go to this firm. They know how to get it. So I did. And I paid, you know, many thousands of dollars. But I figured, hey, this is going to be worth it because nobody else is going to have this. Then I had to find a supplier of headphones that could be programmed with music. And I found a company initially that was in New York, found out that those batteries didn't last nearly long enough because the idea, the first headphone had a built-in MP3 player in one side and a lithium battery in the other. So the benefit of that is they're completely self-contained, no cords to get tangled up with IVs or blood pressure cuffs or anything like that, completely self-contained. And then I got a business coach in Louisville who said, Alice, you're going to have to go to China. You, You got to go to Alibaba because they're the ones that make all technology. When he said go to China on the internet, of course. Right. <laughs> so I found, I had to research loads of headphone manufacturers in China and get samples and try them out and all of that. But I did that and I finally found a company that would make headphones for me, very reasonable. They were already making something similar. But instead of the built-in MP3 player, it had a micro SD card. 
So that was 2.0, I would say. And problems accrued with that too. I mean, for one thing, I had like 500 headphones in my house that took up two or three rooms. And I thought, this is crazy. You know, I'm going to have to get a warehouse. And I did. My business coach helped me find a business over in Southern Indiana that was basically a fulfillment house. Okay. And when I would get an order from hospitals, they would program the headphone and mail it to the hospital or the headphones. But even that was way too slow. So I finally came up with another way, which I really can't say. It's sort of a business secret or something. I don't want to tell you exactly how I do it, but it's working very well. And I made a conscious decision to switch from selling primarily to surgical patients to selling to hospitals. So from B to C to B to B. And that has really helped a lot. I do a lot on LinkedIn. I connect with a lot of anesthesiologists. I'm in medical device groups. I'm in medical device sales reps groups. Let me stop right there. I don't want to give everything away. Yeah. So tell us about your team right now. You know, you've got a team of advisors and specialists. Yes. Yes. If you look at my website, which mm -hmm. is surgicalserenitysolutions.com, I have an advisory board, but the main other person, I guess I call him my COO, is the guy he was in Louisville. Now he lives in Brooklyn. And when I get a big order, he puts the headphones and music together and labels them and sends a code because I have five different playlists. You can choose between classical, jazz, new age, lullabies, or memory care. So I pretty much got the lifespan covered. Right. And when I get a big order from a hospital, Aaron is the one who fulfills the big orders. And then I have a young woman locally who does patient orders. If I get an order for one or two headphones, she fulfills that. Then I have a business coach in Iowa who helps me mostly with email marketing, internet marketing, website issues. And she and I both use a virtual assistant who does a lot of things for me with the website and updating it and all of that. Now I have a new business coach who's in San Diego and he has some very, very big ideas for the company that is going to change a lot of stuff in terms of how the music is put onto the headphones and adding more playlists, but also from going from a model where hospitals order like 25 to 50 headphones and then they come with disposable ear covers and you wipe the band down between patients so they can be reused safely between patients. Well, my new coach wants every patient to get their own headphone and take it home to use for further recovery at home. But we're going to probably reduce the price of the headphone which currently is $250 and say, if you order 500, you're going to get a much, much lower price, but they're to be given to every surgical patient. And it can be white labeled for that company, Cleveland right. Clinic, Mayo Clinic, you know, Johns Hopkins, whatever, they'll have their name on the headphone and it'll say in conjunction with surgical serenity solutions. Right. And we'll have real medical value, not just fuzzy slippers. Right. <laughs> so what's something you wish more people knew about your business? Just that we even exist, you know, because even though I've had my own website literally since the late nineties and I'm on LinkedIn, I've got a Facebook group. I've got four Facebook pages besides my personal page, because I also have another business, Mark. I don't know that you know that I'm also a therapist. Uh, yes, that's actually on your website. I saw that it said you have three businesses. Well, yes, because speaking is one business. Okay, that's the third one. Okay. So Healing Music Enterprises is now mainly my speaking business. And I'm going to Barcelona next week and I'm going to be meeting and speaking to a group of music therapists over there and a CEO of another music medicine company. So I love to travel. And any excuse to go to Europe or the Caribbean or anything. I spoke in South Korea a few years ago oh, to wow. a, at a neurosurgical hospital there. 
-hmm. And so anyway, despite all of that, I wish more people knew that using the right music during surgery, not just any music. I mean, let me tell you one funny story. One of the ways I got this idea was because I was speaking to a group of nurses here in Louisville. And one of the nurses came up to me afterwards and she said, Dr. Cash, I just want you to know there's a surgeon at my hospital. I won't say the name of the hospital, but one of our local hospitals. And when he operates, he plays the song, you know, in the whole OR for everybody to hear called Another One Bites the Dust. (laughs) And she said, I just think that's awful. And I said, I do too. That's not nice, you know. And he doesn't mean it, I'm sure, in a horrible way, but he's trying to be lighthearted, I suppose. But anyway, that's why I decided, okay, the patient needs their slow, steady, soothing music through headphones. And the surgeon can play whatever he wants because you're not going to tell the surgeon what to play. Right. But if he can play whatever he wants through speakers in the ceiling, a boombox nearby, well, no more boom boxes, I guess, an iPad or Bluetooth speakers, then the patient can still have their music. And the patient doesn't have to hear subconsciously comments that sometimes they wake up saying, I heard them saying it didn't look good, that it was worse than they thought. And you do not want the patient hearing that. Right. So how are you marketing? Well, I have a newsletter that I send out every couple of weeks, but LinkedIn, I would say, is my number one. I I don't do much hard copy marketing at all. I used to have, you know, I would go to the Venture Connectors every month, and I I did a lot of pitches. As a matter of fact, I was the winner of their first Venture Shark competition, and I got lots of good PR there, I think. I went to the Network of Entrepreneurial Women, which was very, very good. I would say probably the Venture Connectors was one of my best in-person groups. But I mean, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, Surgical Serenity Solutions, all my accounts say that. And I tweet probably three or four times a day. Instagram sort of follows from my Facebook. Whatever I post on the Facebook also goes to Instagram. But LinkedIn, I try to post research studies every day. I try to connect with big hospitals around the country. And it is happening. But now that I have this new coach in San Diego, I think things are seriously getting ready to grow a lot because he's a very experienced marketer. Awesome. So what's been the most memorable part of starting your own business and going down that path? Oh, I would have to say getting the patent. I mean, that was a real exciting moment for me because I wasn't at all sure that I would be able to. I knew nobody else had done this, but there seemed to be a lot of red tape and hoops to jump through. And I just wasn't sure whether that would happen. So when I finally did get the patent, that was just, it was like, okay, this is going to happen. I don't know for sure how long it's going to take till I'm retired on the beach, but I know that it's going to happen. And I have never yet talked to a doctor or a nurse who didn't say, Alice, that's a great idea. I wish I had thought of that. And I can't believe nobody had already thought of that. But I guess the ability to program headphones was really not there. Mm -hmm. You know, you could, like I did back in the early 90s, you could bring in a Walkman. But, you know, you the OR is pretty small and you can't have a lot of seemingly extraneous devices in there. Right. What's been the most memorable roadblock or challenge other than the patent that you had to overcome? Well, there's some other sort of clearances that have been recommended. Like if I could get my device to be insurance reimbursable, that would be huge. That would be great. Because then if they know the insurance is going to reimburse, they'll order them by the thousands every month, every hospital. But at the moment, It's not that it's not worthy of being insurance reimbursable, but you have to get something called a CPT code. Mm -hmm. And that's another one of those huge, lots of red tape, lots of money to get that code and have people almost lobby for you and explain in great detail. So I feel like whoever takes over my business, I mean, I'm 75 now. And I really would like to turn the business over to some people that I handpick and that I can guide for the first 
two or three years because it it's a bit of a learning curve although i feel like i've turned it into an almost turnkey process right now but we do need the cpt code right other than finding an heir apparent where do you see the business going in the next three to five years I really feel like if it continues as it has for the past three to five years, we will begin to go across the pond and be around Europe. Already a hospital in the Netherlands has created their version sort of. And because my patent is only USA, I can't say anything about that. But I'm honored that they recognize the merits of this. But I think since I've spoken in South Korea, it'll get to Asia It'll get to Europe. I think it'll eventually be around the world and will be just as common in surgery as anesthesia or the things that are there right now. Right. And I would like to get playlists that represent all people. I mean, my playlists are the music that we know, you know, mm. Westerners, familiar classical, lullabies, jazz, the memory care is music mostly from the 20s, 30s, 40s, that people who maybe are early dementia, they begin to not recognize their family, where they are, but they can still hear that music from their courting years and say, oh, I know that, and sing along and clap, tap. And it's really a wonderful thing. I did that study at the medical school on music with Alzheimer's patients. And that's when I realized that was so powerful. So I thought, let me make a surgery playlist that's memory care and has those same kind of pieces. Mm -hmm. But like what I'm saying is I would like to have music that people in India would find comforting. People in South America, people in Africa, people in China. I want to have playlists. But again, I think whoever carries the company into the future, you know, I will suggest that. And hopefully they, you can find composers anywhere in the world to write the music or to put together a playlist of music that's already out there. My music is all original. One of the barriers I would say at first was I realized you had to pay. I can't just make a playlist of classic rock or right. Beatles tunes or anything like that without paying huge royalties, which right. they deserve, believe me, but I don't have the budget to pay these huge royalties. So I thought, let me use the music that I know. And as a classical musician, I know the classical repertoire pretty well. So I chose music that has long been in public domain. Okay. You don't have to pay royalties. And it's right. myself and a friend of mine, playing on the piano, the classical music and the lullabies and memory care. And then the jazz playlist, I actually commissioned a local jazz trio, Mike Tracy and his group to create the jazz playlist. So I don't have to worry about, you know, being sued by anybody. Right. It's been quite a process, but it's it's been fun, but it's also been very time consuming. And I have three children and five grandchildren now. Oh, awesome. And I didn't have any grandchildren when I started. So that's one of the reasons I'm looking for my heir apparent now. Okay. Over the years, what has been the most impactful business advice that you got from somebody? You know, in the early days, I heard a speaker at our National Speakers or Kentucky Speakers Association meeting, and he said, friends, if you don't have a website, you're not in business. I thought, whoa, I guess I better get a website. <laughs> so I got a website from a guy here in Louisville, and the rest is history. Now, I didn't realize at first that you need to start a list you know, a mailing list, and right. you need to have what's called an opt-in to yep. get people on your mailing list. So in the early 2000s, maybe late 90s, I started a monthly e-zine and you had to opt into that. But I would tell everybody, you know, go to the, this website and opt in and you get my free e-zine every month that tells you how to use music for healing purposes. And so Healing Music Enterprises was sort of the original business. Okay. And then a piece broke off into Surgical Serenity Solutions. Well, that's an amazing story. And being an inventor, you know, I, I've got a couple of patents, but I worked at a big corporation and it was part of a team. 
still a lot of fun, still really cool, but I've had more patents denied because as you said, that's a really hard process. So it is. The fact that you were able to get yours patented. I really congratulate you because that's a Thank lot you. of work and investment and time. And it means you've truly built something unique. Thank so you. That is really cool. I'm really in awe of that. So we've covered a lot of ground today. So to kind of wrap us up here, I've got a few kind of quick questions sure. and, uh, before wrap ups. What is your key to success? Chipping away every day and keeping my positivity, my enthusiasm, and I am happy when I'm working. I feel so lucky. To me, work isn't drudgery or anything. I love doing what I do. So even when I go next week to Barcelona and then a cruise after that, I'm not going to take my laptop, but I will have my iPhone with me every second. I'll check emails. I'll answer emails, whatever I need to do. Awesome. What's one piece of advice that you would give to the business owners that are watching us today? And that are just starting out or in process? Either. Could be either. <laughs> well, I would say get a regular schedule of marketing tools, whether it's LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, whatever you do. I have a YouTube channel. I mean, I've got it all. But have a schedule of when you do each one of those and just do it like clockwork every day. Don't just wait till you think of it, which I sort of did that for a while. But, you know, know that every day, no later than five o'clock, you're going to have a new LinkedIn post or better yet, an original LinkedIn article. I do repost a lot of interesting things pertinent to my business, but then I have 25 original articles that I've written for LinkedIn. And I think the more original stuff you can write, the better and the more credible you become. Okay. What's one book that you're reading now or that you've read recently that you would recommend to other entrepreneurs? You know, a book that was recommended, I think, at Cancun University was that book called The Tipping Point. Uh huh. I no. thought that was no. a no. very good book. And don't ask me who wrote it. I can't remember at the moment, but he's written a lot of good business books. Yeah, I'm pretty um, sure that's uh, Malcolm Gladwell. I think you're right. Yes, that was very helpful to me. And also just, you know, the speaker community does a lot with the Think and Grow Rich, that mm -hmm. book from the 30s or something, still very valid today. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of a man named Ted Nicholas. No, but he was a huge marketer that sort of invented the long form sales letters we used to get in the mail all the time that had the big yellow highlighted areas and all of Ted Nicholas stuff was very, very oh. helpful to me. NSA as a whole, National Speakers Organization, if business owners are interested in getting into that, I highly recommend it. Okay. And our local chapter is very active and very helpful. If I had a magic wand, then I could improve one area of your business right now by waving it over you. What would that be? That would be for every hospital in the United States anyway, to suddenly hear about Surgical Serenity Solutions and say, oh, yes, we definitely want to get that for our patients immediately. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Before I get to my very last question, so if people want to learn more about you, how can I get more? You know, you're on. LinkedIn is probably my best business site and it's Dr. Alice H. Cash. Okay. And if you just put my name in, just search for that or search for Surgical Serenity Solutions. I have a business page, but my profile page also has everything about my business. Right. And then you're on. Uh, and then, and then my on. website, my website, surgicalserenitysolutions.com. And I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but I found that Surgical Serenity had already been taken and wow. Serenity Solutions had already been taken. So I said, okay, Surgical Serenity Solutions, how about that? And it, it's worked pretty well. Yeah. And then you said you're also on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook? Exactly. Yes. There is a, an article site called medium.com. Okay. That's free. You can repost your articles and I'm on there. I think there's some more too, but those are the biggies for sure. Okay, great. Our last question today, what inspires you most right now? Oh, I guess just to see all of the new technological advances coming down. 
what is it? Chat GPT. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that amazes me. And the whole AI phenomenon, you know, all of that I see on TV and on 60 Minutes the other day, they're saying they think it will eventually get smarter than humans. Mm -hmm. And so we've just got to make sure it likes us and doesn't turn against us and try to take over the world. I mean, it's a little scary, but it's also very inspiring to me to, you know, in space travel. I love all of that stuff. All right. <laughs> Music well, on Mars. That's what I want. <laughs> music. Okay. That's the next business. All right. We need to get started on that. You need to go grab that domain that, that domain name and get something going. So I like that music on Mars. <laughs> Thank you so much. So this has been Dr. Alice Cash, CEO, founder of Surgical Serenity Solutions. Learned so much from you today. We really appreciate you coming on and sharing with us. I'm Coach Mark with Action Coach Bluegrass. I appreciate all of you. Make sure you listen to it a couple of times because there's a lot of little nuggets in there. And she shared a whole lot of business advice and also personal advice. We all know somebody who is going through surgery and that should start demanding technology like this that can make that process so much easier for them. Thank you all for watching us today. And we'll see you again in our next session. Thanks, Mark.